morning, if you would join me in Mark chapter 10. This is our third week in this passage, and perhaps we'll finish today. It kind of depends on what arises, but we're looking at Jesus as he is being tempted by the Pharisees. They seek to trap him by asking him a question about divorce. We've looked at several issues about this today. Today we'll actually look at the issue of divorce and remarriage. Mark chapter 10 and verse 1. And he left there, that is Galilee, and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, to trap him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And again, I've got to emphasize this. There's a great political pressure right here. Uh, he's in Herod's territory, who has divorced his wife and married someone else. And the person he married had divorced her husband to marry him. So this is a very loaded question. He answered them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house... The disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And she divorces her husband and marries another. She commits adultery. This is the Word of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is not theoretical. We pray today for help. Help me to teach. Help us to learn. Help the hurting. Give hope. Give healing. Give us holiness in our marriages. We pray, God, in a world that just doesn't get it, that as a church, we would at least get it and live it out. Help us today to be equipped. Help us to be equipped, Lord, for our own marriages and in our counsel to others. And Lord, and this is not a marriage seminar. This is ultimately about Christ and the church. We want to see Jesus today. I want to be reminded of what we just sang, that He will keep us till we're safely home. And so today, give us a wonderful time of worship as we seriously contemplate this hard saying. Holy Spirit, teach us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. 
As we've seen, this passage doesn't merely equip us with proof texting for facing tough questions in this world. In the answer to the question about the permissibility of divorce, Jesus goes back to first principles. And we see as he does that that his teaching is very, very radically different from the even religious leaders of the day. The Christian who takes God's word seriously will have a worldview that's radically different from the world's. Particularly when it comes to the, marriage, the matter of sexuality, gender, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. You really want to remember this and always keep this in mind that Jesus here is not merely answering questions for sake of silencing a debate. He is discipling disciples. He is teaching his disciples faithfully that they must be faithful with God's word. I, I love it in verse 1 when it says, again, as was his custom, he taught them it was customary for Jesus Christ to forthrightly teach the word of God. He was fearless about that. Jesus is discipling his disciples about marital fidelity. He's speaking to them about being salt. In fact, the end of chapter 9, just before we get into this passage, he speaks about have salt in yourselves. And Jesus wants these disciples to be covenantally, covenantally faithful to God. And that means being covenantally faithful in all their relationships. Particularly when relationships are difficult. Jesus speaks in this passage about the so-called sanctity of marriage. It's very important that we realize that what we do in our homes does affect our church and affects our culture. So there's a real sense today what I want to kind of do is looking at one another as salt shakers and kind of filling us today with the salt of God's Word that we can go and pour it into our homes and pour it into our culture to be used of God for His glory in the preservation of our homes and of our church and of our society. Jesus, if you could sum this up, when He's asked about the question about divorce, basically, if I could put this in a colloquial way, was saying simply this, don't mess with the one flesh. The very simply, that when a man and woman are joined in marriage, they become one flesh, and that is to be inviolable, that is to be indivisible. One flesh. I want to give you several things about this matter of divorce, remarriage this morning, but first of all, we have to start with the establishment of a marriage. Keep in mind that a home, a marriage, is established when two human beings of the opposite sex from different families make a consensual commitment to keep themselves sexually just for each other. This past Thursday, I had the joy of uh, performing another wedding ceremony. Someone asked me the other day, how many of those have you done? I've done a ton of them. And it's always special as Jenny and Sam exchanged vows. Uh, I made it clear in the ceremony they were both human beings. They were both of the opposite sex and from different families. And though I wasn't descriptive about this, they were making a consensual commitment right there to live together as husband and wife, as one flesh. That's the establishment of a home. What we have to keep in mind here is that it's God who does this. If you look with me at verse 6, he's answering this question and he tells the disciples, God permitted that certificate of divorce because of the hardness of your heart. I'll look at that later. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Hold fast, you could translate that glued to. It's like gluing two pieces of wood together with a super glue. 
and that you really can't pull that apart and if you pull that apart there's going to be a, an uneven break they cleave to one another he's speaking here about the sexual union between a man and his wife a husband and the wife he says and the two shall become one flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh and then look at verse 9 what therefore God has joined together let not man separate. I think that so much of the debate about divorce can be silenced if we just meditated on this, what God has joined together. This is not two people being joined together by the church. This is not two people being joined together by the state. This is two people being joined together by God, and we shouldn't mess with what his one flesh. It's God who is doing this. It is God who establishes the marriage. Jesus is saying that this one flesh reality makes divorce forbidden, because he says, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. God has done this. Man needs to respect this. Entering into marriage, as I often say in the wedding ceremony, is therefore to be done advisedly, soberly, and in the fear of God. If a marriage is established by God, that's a sobering thing, isn't it? It, it might be a sobering thing. Have you ever bought a house and you sign on the dotted line? That's a sobering thing. Or you buy a vehicle and you sign on the dotted line and you have that buyer's remorse. Particularly a guy who buys lemons all the time. <laughs> but that's a human contract. This is something that God has brought together. And can I just say this as we are just beginning this, that when a couple is going to be married, they really need counsel. They need to understand what's involved in this commitment. It needs to be emphasized that this is until death parts you. And this is where fathers come in. I have done a lot of premarital counseling and I'm quite happy to do that. But can I, and I've said this over and over again over the years. Fathers, counsel your sons and daughters about marriage. Don't leave it up to me. I'm happy to help. But God expects Christian fathers to be equipped from the Word of God to raise their children and to teach them this is what marriage is. We want our children going into marriages well instructed. We need to help the couple before marriage to understand that when they say, I do, they're also saying, therefore, I won't. I do pledge myself to you wholly, therefore, I won't engage with another woman or another man. Jesus has joined us together, and therefore, man is not to separate that. We oftentimes look for loopholes. I have friends, I have family who have been divorced and they were counseled that because you're not happy and certainly God wants you to be happy, therefore go with the divorce. The text says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. This one flesh relationship is such that it's a serious thing to drive a wedge between a husband and a wife. A home established in accordance with God's creation ordinance is a serious thing to mess with. It's a serious thing to divide. And therefore, those of us who are married, we need to guard our relationship, guard against inappropriate relationships. I am obtuse when it comes to many things. If a woman flirted with me, I wouldn't know it. I really am thick. Or no one's ever flirted with me. That's probably more the case. 
that's probably closer to the truth. <laughs> I can remember years ago when my wife said to me, I'm uncomfortable with a particular woman spending time with you. It was some ministerial thing. And that's all I needed to hear. And I found somebody else to do the counseling. We need to listen to our husbands. We need to listen to our wives. We want to guard against inappropriate relationships. What does it mean God has joined together and that they are one flesh? Let me flesh, flesh this out. Obviously, physically, it means the sexual consummation, the ongoing celebration of that consummation. It's, it's a good thing. It's a very, very good thing. And so there's no doubt that the primary thing Jesus is speaking here is this consensual commitment to have sex only with your spouse. But it also involves emotional aspect. The one flesh relationship involves entering into the lives of each other in the ups and the downs. Marriage involves sharing of joys and sorrows, and we need to, to build on this. When you become one flesh that expands one's relationships as two families come together, as friends, friends from each spouse are sometimes shared, and perhaps children come into their lives, and so your social network grows. And so you do that as one flesh. But we don't want to miss the point, a major point here, that when the two become one, and this is, this is a biggie, that if a Christian marries a, 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 a Christian, then there is a spiritual dynamic to that one flesh. Which, by the way, is why God forbids a Christian to marry a non-Christian. It was Tommy and Jimmy Guthrie's anniversary yesterday, and just sent her a message saying I was praying for her and thinking of her on this special day. And Jim went home to be with the Lord some time ago. And I noticed her WhatsApp profile was just a wonderful picture of her and Jim. And I just smiled as I, I saw that because I knew that couple when Tommy was a Christian and Jimmy was not. And I also knew them after he became a Christian. And how that marriage was strengthened in a oneness. Because they could share Christ together. I, I feel for particularly Christian wives married to men who, I don't want to be unkind, but they're, they're spiritual eunuchs. They do not produce spiritually. Many women have married men who have claimed to be Christians and then they find out later, actually they don't love Christ. You know, the wife loves the husband and at one level the marriage is good. There's a huge vacuum in that marriage. Because they're not one flesh when it comes to serving Christ. We want to advise people before they get married to make sure that you are marrying a Christian, not just in name only. The one flesh relationship that God establishes, it's physical, it's emotional, it's social, it is spiritual. And because of this one flesh relationship, there's the expectation of this, of this marriage being together until death do you part. When I did the ceremony on Thursday, I said to Jenny and Sam, in many ways today you're making a covenant to do some things that actually you're, you're unaware of. That, that today you're saying, for better, for worse, and that might mean sometime just a hard time because of a minor offense. But to stay together for better or for worse might mean someday you have to really forgive the other one for some major sin. For richer, for poorer. Right now that might mean where you're at right now and you don't have a lot of money, but it might mean one day you're unemployed and you're in poverty and yet God expects you to stay together. What about in sickness and in health? That might mean a minor cold or flu. And I know man flu is not minor, but... <laughs> but it might mean one day cancer. It might be a debilitating chronic illness. And you're covenanting that God's joining you together and you will love one another. 
through it all. That's God's expectation. The Pharisees are looking for loopholes. Yeah, but didn't Moses say something about divorce? Hang on, Jesus says. What God has joined together, don't let anyone separate. That's God's intention. But thirdly, there's the, the actual breaking of a marriage. Because it happens. The disciples, when they heard this, they heard Jesus very clearly. But therefore God is joined together. Let not man separate. And they go to the house, and that was often a pattern in Mark, and they come to the house, and the disciples ask him again about this matter. Matthew's parallel account in chapter 19. They said to Jesus, if that's the case, then nobody should get married. Because what you're saying is pretty absolute. They heard him right. And by the way, Peter was married. He's probably asking this question. Whoa. We've been raised in a culture that has given us loopholes and you're saying God has joined us together. Don't let anyone separate. Did we hear you right? He said to them, let me tell you clearly, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Jesus recognizes that we live in a broken world and there is sometimes broken marriages. I read this week where Larry King, radio talk host, after 22 years of marriage, he's 85 years of age, after 22 years of marriage, he's divorcing his wife. This would be his eighth divorce. One woman he married, divorced, married again. So this, this is his seventh wife. I don't think he read Mark. Larry King's not a Christian. No, we don't excuse that. As Christians, we do need to pay very close attention to what Jesus does teach about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The question is, is divorce lawful? Because that's what the Pharisees ask him. Jesus doesn't talk much about divorce. He talks about what marriage is. Because he's emphasizing, if you really focus on marriage, you don't have to worry about divorce, but that is a reality we face. I read a really bad article in News 24 this week. Some guy named I think Larry Mason wrote an article about five financial steps before you get married. And one of them was this, that, you know, he understood that when people get married, they still want to maintain their financial independence. And I just wanted to scream. The two shall be one. And then he said this, he said, a prenuptial agreement is, he said, many people think, like me, a prenuptial, a prenuptial agreement is um, an admission of failure. He said, it's not the case, but it is security in case it fails. <laughs> Jesus said, let's talk about marriage. He talks about marriage and he drives such a strong point home that he really wants to put the fear in God in us about divorce. What is a divorce? Divorce, the word divorce, it's used several times in our passage, means to, to free, it means to relieve, it means to dismiss. Remember in Matthew 1.19 where Mo, uh, uh, Joseph finds out that Mary's expecting and it says he was minded, the King James says he was minded to put her away privily. To put away. It's the word for divorce. Mark 6.36 uses the same Greek term and translates to send them away. In Mark 15, 6, 6 and 11 and 15, the word release. Speaking of, they released Barabbas. Acts 4, 21, and we'll see this tonight, where the officials let them go. And in Hebrews 13, 23, it's translated by the word to set free. A divorce is simply this. It's dismissing. It's letting go. It is giving up your commitment. It's a real sense, just like with marriage, the church doesn't establish a marriage, and the state doesn't establish 
a marriage, neither does a state establish a divorce. In fact, if we understood this, there'd be a whole lot less divorce lawyers in our society. Divorce doesn't take place when you go to the courtroom. The divorce has taken place when you decided to end your commitment. Divorce takes place when a spouse, or in some cases when both spouses refuse to fulfill their covenantal commitment to live as one flesh. It means I'm saying that no longer I do. Before we look at the so-called exception of divorce, I want you to go to Malachi chapter 2. Because Malachi chapter 2 is really, in many ways, a historic backdrop to what Jesus is facing in Mark chapter 10, though it's hundreds of years earlier. The same kind of spiritual climate exists in Jesus' day. Malachi 2 and verse 10. Have we not all one Father? <clears throat> He's speaking here about the nation of Israel. They're, they're in a covenant relationship with one another. Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? What does he mean? Judah has been faithless and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. I think there's two thoughts here. There's a spiritual adultery on the part of the nation of Judah. They are worshiping idols. They have, they have um, committed a spiritual adultery against God. But as the next passage shows, it's interesting where they were spiritually affected them maritally as well. Verse 13, And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. These guys are weeping. They're saying, we don't understand. We're bringing our offering. We're coming to church. But you say, why does he not? Why does he accept this? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. It's quite clear here that it seems to me, the problem was these guys were divorcing their wives who they had married when they were young. Now they're older. They're divorcing them probably for younger women. Sound familiar? Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her. Some translations say for the man who hates his wife and divorces her. Older translations say the Lord, the God of Israel, says that he hates divorce. There's a translation issue there. But notice what he says here. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. The nation of Israel, Judah, was a mess spiritually and it was showing up in the homes. Because they were not covenantally faithful to God, they were not being covenantally faithful in their marriage. And it leads to husbands hating their wives and divorcing them, which, if you allow the older translation, God certainly hates. God hates divorce. Because God has joined the two together and no man is to separate them. Marriage is for the long haul. It is until death. It's interesting how Malachi, and God through Malachi, says to, the, says to these people, guard your spirits, guard your hearts. 
I've been married for a long time, 35 years. That's not a long time for some people, but for many, that's a, that's a lifetime. And our marriage has not always been perfect. In fact, I share this with uh, Jill's permission. It wasn't that too, too long ago that um, we just weren't really connecting very well. I know this is hard to believe, but I'm not an easy guy to live with always. <laughs> And there was strain there. At no time do we ever think about ending this. Because keep in mind that that word divorce in many ways should not be used in your home. And so we uh, went away. And we do this occasionally. We go away. This time we, we went away to Woodmead. We don't like to travel far. <laughs> Sometimes we'll do that. We'll just get a hotel somewhere in the city. Just to get away from the dogs. <laughs> and we had a weekend together and we talked through some things. It was just what we needed. We had to really just be honest about the way we were treating one another. Me and me. We had to be honest about that and talk about that. And it's been, it's been glorious since then. I'm like a new man. <laughs> and there's been times still since then we have to work on things. But I just share that and I wanted to share that because people have the idea that sometimes it's just easy for everybody. It's not easy for anybody. You gotta work. You gotta guard your heart. You gotta guard your tongue, and sometimes you have to use your tongue, you have to talk. You have to communicate. And you build the relationship. And Jill is my best friend, and when I die, I want her to still be my best friend. But a better friend than I've had for 35 years, another 35 years. We've got to work at this. I don't think marriage is particularly hard. It can be for some people. I understand that. But it does require work. It involves and calls for guarding our spirit and guarding our hearts. Jesus wants his disciples to be disciples. To call him Lord. Even in the midst of difficult situations in our, in our homes. And he gives this absolute statement that whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So we have to ask and answer this question. But with a different spirit than the Pharisees, is it ever lawful to put away your husband? Is it ever lawful to put away your wife? And I would suggest to you that there are two, two situations where it's permissible but it's never commanded. And the first one is for adultery. Jesus said in the parallel passage in Matthew 19, when he answered the question, he said, except for fornication. In fact, in Matthew 5.32 in the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about a man and a woman being married and nothing to separate them. That divorce is not permissible except for fornication. The word fornication is a broader word for sexual immorality. You have to get a word pornography from that. So we just pause there for a moment. There's a lot of pharisaical men saying, I never slept with another woman who are sitting in the privacy of their office on a cell phone or a computer and you're sexually being unfaithful to your wife. The sexting that happens. If we're not careful, we fall in the same trap with the Pharisees with legalistic loopholes. I think Jesus said except for fornication because he, was, he knew he was dealing with a bunch of legalists. And he said, do not commit any kind of sexual sin against your wife. But when there is adultery, and this is the question we have to answer, does that mean that the marriage relationship is over? And 
I don't think Scripture teaches that. I think there are situations where perhaps when there is serial adultery, that the best thing in that case, because we live in a broken world, would be a divorce. But too often times, people run to this passage in Matthew 19, Matthew 5, 32, except for fornication, and they almost use it as a, as a, as a, as a card. Jill and I know somebody that in the church we grew up in, that about 20 years after a lady had been unfaithful to her husband, 20 years later, he comes to the pastor and he says, you know, I was reading the Bible about, about except for fornication, and uh, basically what he's saying is, I want to use that card. Get out of this marriage. Lo and behold, he divorced his wife, and guess what? Two months later, he was married to another woman. I want to be careful about that. I do think that in many, many cases, when a man has committed adultery or a wife has committed adultery against her husband, you want to, you want to persevere for grace and forgiveness. I can't tell you the number of people I've dealt with where that's happened and there's been adultery, but because of the grace of the gospel of God, that marriage has not just survived, but it's been strengthened. God allows that. It's a concession. It's not a commandment. Here's another case in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 to 16, and you can discuss this in your grace groups this week. But in that passage, it's quite clear where Paul's dealing with people who are married to unbelievers. And he says, if the unbelieving wife will remain, wants to remain with the believing husband, or the unbelieving husband is content to continue to be married to his believing wife, fine. He said, you don't end it because it's an unbeliever. I was talking to someone yesterday, and they were telling me that somebody they know who says that if you're married to an unbeliever, you can divorce them because in Ezra chapter 10 and Nehemiah 13, you had Jews divorcing pagan wives. That's a stretch. Paul makes it very clear, if the unbelieving wants to remain, you stay in that marriage. But if they choose to depart, then you're free. You let them go. It's not kind of a flippant statement he's making. He's saying to them, because of your faith in Christ, you may lose your marriage. They may abandon you. And if they abandon you, then I think the, the same text teaches that you are free to remarry. So those are cases where there's an allowance. So you say, why didn't Jesus mention the allowance here? He didn't mention the allowance here because he was saying, let's talk about marriage. He's not denying that those two exceptions are there. He's already said that in Matthew 19. But he wants us to focus on this one flesh union is not to be messed with. It may not show this morning, but I have probably never spent more time preparing for a message than this one. I have spent lots of hours. Not so much about the text, because I get the text. But just the pastoral issue behind this. Because I'm well aware that there are many people here today in this hall who have instituted a divorce or have experienced a divorce. There are many people in this hall who have entered into a, another marriage after a divorce. And I want to just address this to you, actually to all of us, because we have to all be equipped. Sometimes in different cultures we make some particular sins unpardonable. Mark, who wrote this, recorded these words of Jesus, also recorded the words of Jesus in chapter 3 and verse 21, 28, saying, all sins will be forgiven. He 
You don't have to live with a, a stigma if you had an unbiblical divorce and remarriage. And you need to just let that sink in. Divorce is painful. It's devastating. You know, you hear about amicable divorces. Maybe relatively that is a true statement, but I doubt any divorce is completely amicable. Because you have two that are being split. And so there's great heartache. There's great pain. In some cases, there's a great sense of failure. There's a great sense of shame. No sin is unpardonable. There's forgiveness. And there's hope. There are people who wrestle with this and say, but I, I shouldn't have gotten divorced. And I shouldn't have remarried. What do I do now? Can I tell you what you do now? You come back to this passage. And you say, There are no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. You make this marriage work. You're not living in a perpetual state of adultery. You make the marriage work. And I know many such marriages. I've shared this many times. I shared with the VIP group on Wednesday. A dear friend of mine who's with the Lord now. He taught me how to paint houses when I was just married and needed to put food on the table. Because we were getting hungry just living on love. <laughs> this man had been a youth pastor in a large Baptist church that I knew of. And he actually committed adultery with one of the young people. Ran off with her and married her. Divorced his wife, left his wife and his baby daughter. I met him years after this. We became good friends. And one day we were painting this massive cupboard in a mansion of a house and he just put his brush down and he said, Doug, do you think God could ever forgive me? I said, sure. And this man got right with God. And the woman he was married to was the, was the young woman he'd run off with. And she became a dear Christian. And they served God together until he died at the age of 62 of Alzheimer's. It was a terrible death. But they were a lovely couple. Was that plan A? No. But you know what? God's always helping people with plan Bs. He's a God of second chances. There's heartache. But there's gospel-driven compassion and hope. And that's why, if I can, and I, I need to wrap this up, but I, I want to say this. The time to be really hard and un, uh, unshakable is in the counseling before a couple gets married. And after the damage is done, that's not the time to beat them up. That's the time to come alongside and say, okay, how are we going to help you? The church needs to be a place of deep compassion and helping those who are carry heartache. Why was Jesus so passionate? But what God has joined together, let not man separate. Why was he so passionate about guarding this one flesh relationship? I never tire of repeating this in wedding ceremonies. And I said it here last week in a different way. It's because Jesus Christ came to earth as a groom seeking his bride with whom he'd become one flesh forever. Paul makes that very clear. Read it this afternoon in Ephesians 5, 22 to 32. And again, quoting Genesis 2, 24, the same verse Jesus is quoting here in verse 8. 
where Paul says that whole verse about becoming one flesh, Paul says, let me tell you, when Moses wrote that, he didn't get it, but I get it now in this new dispensation. I get it. He was speaking about Christ and the church. Christ is one flesh with his bride, the church. And because Jesus Christ will never leave us or forsake us, because our relationship with Him is, is secure, I, I mark these words, our last hymn we sang, He has freed us, He will keep us till we're safely home. That's the kind of groom He is. It's the kind of husband He is. It's because of that He was saying, I want you to guard the one flesh relationship because it pictures my relationship with the church. That's why no matter how difficult the marriage is, I am persuaded by the, by, by the grace of the gospel of God, you can persevere through that to the glory of God. God's good gift finds its ultimate fulfillment in the relationship between Jesus Christ and His bride, the church. Jesus' commitment to His bride is such that Think about this. I mean, the Pharisees were saying, yeah, but the text says, if you find something indecent in her, you know what? Every day Jesus finds something indecent in me. To my shame. Every day he finds something unclean in me, but he doesn't issue me a certificate of divorce. He loves me. And then he cleanses me. Because in one day... I'll be without blemish and without spot in the consummation of this marriage. That's good news. Perhaps you're single. Perhaps you'll never be married. Can I just say this to single people and I'm, I, I'm, I may come back to this. I would no more pity a person who is single then I would pity Jesus Christ who lived 33 years as a single man. Marriage is a wonderful gift. But there's a greater gift. The Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, there are single people who have taught me so much about the church and have taught me so much about a relationship with Jesus Christ because that is their focus. The one flesh relationship. Jesus said, don't mess with the one flesh relationship because look at my one flesh relationship with my bride, the church. Dear people, there is hope and there is forgiveness because there is a Savior. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would give to us, as the song says, Christian homes. The husbands and wives in this room would be followers of Christ and be faithful disciples to keep their covenantal commitment. I pray today, Lord, for brothers and sisters in this room who have experienced the heartache, the shattering devastation of divorce. Would you please a very special way, point them to you, the great groom, who never leave them nor forsake them. For those, Lord, who find themselves in marriages where they realize maybe they should not have done this, may they look to you and realize they can't change the past, but they can make the most out of the present. So help us on this journey together. 
Help us as fathers, Lord, to be engaged in the lives of our sons and daughters, counseling and preparing them for the day that perhaps they will get married. May we see healthier marriages and healthier homes in the future. So help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.